And now, weighing in out of the blue corner, Josh the Pong Thompson. 100% agree. And on the other mic, he weighs in from the red corner, Big John McCarthy. Well, welcome to the Weighing In Podcast. We just witnessed UFC 308 from Abu Dhabi. And man, I'll tell you what, there were some fights. And you got to admit it. I got to say it. Ilya Tapuria just did what no one has ever done. I got to hand it to the man. I know he's a stud, but he just knocked out the man that does not get knocked out. Max Holloway, what a fight. What a win by Tapuria. He is starting to put a stamp on that featherweight division that he is there and he is there to stay. Big night, my man, Josh. How you feeling there? Oahu Golf. I see you in the yeah. background with your hands on hard. Yeah. Ready to go. Let's go. Man, uh, it was good, man. The, the card was good. The fighters fought their butts off. I mean, they you did. know, there was there was a lot of there was a couple fights on the prelims. Eh, you could question the uh, the decision. There was one on the main. Yeah, <laughs> it's, I'm calling him the bathroom break guy. So, <laughs> so but John and I were texting back and forth pretty much uh, throughout the whole main card, and we were just laughing back and forth about stuff. But uh, hey, man, we uh, we had some good picks on this fight. We also had some really bad ones. Yeah, I have well, more bad ones than than most, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it was I did still, pretty good. I did. Lo- I did lose the main event, though. Yeah, it's it, like yeah. But there's just a lot go. of ways you could have went on this. Like you know, we were sure. talking about what the best bet US odds, and I actually did a bet US show yesterday uh, on YouTube as a live show, and and kind of the way the the, the main event went, the main event went was take Chamayev early round one submission or finish that. I think it paid out like a plus eight hundred, and then if you That's went to um, and then I, I got Whitaker to go the distance if it went. Yeah, because that was the pl- that was a plus two fifteen. Yeah, something like that. So um, it, it just seemed like, okay, look, you can take it both ways. If you look, if you won the Chamaya by submission in the first round. You're happy. You're happy, and then it doesn't matter that you lost the other 100 bucks yeah. uh, betting down on the on the plus 250. But, but hey, this show is brought to you by BetUS. Hell, and, uh, I'll win 800 to throw you 100, baby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm happy. Uh, but overall, though, I mean, like, look, the fights were good. I had a – it was a good – I just I can't get over the, the uh, middle of the day stuff, man. Like, it's I'm weird. Like, I, yeah, it's, it's a, a well, you, and, you, you, and you got to figure it's rough. It's rough for the UFC based upon you know, especially here in the states. You got college football. Yeah, you're losing a lot of people based upon because you know there's people that are going to sit there and they're they're fight fans, but they're football fans, mm-hmm. and they go, "I, I got to watch my team." You know, they're not as as yeah. into it as us, and I understand it, but it, that's a rough one. For, but you know, that's what you have. You 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 got to cater to the, the hometown people too. I always think it's weird when they have the hometown crowd being there at either six o'clock in the morning or, you know, the fights start at 12 o'clock midnight. That's just weird. That's hard. Yeah. It, it does get a little weird. I was just looking to see if there's any really good college football go- games on today. I know there's one later today. I think Navy's undefeated and then Notre Dame. Notre Dame was on playing it. Same yeah, they're, time. Oh, really? They they're were on up. the same time. Yeah. Oh, they're on the same time. So yeah. But uh, that was the only game I could think of today that actually would have had enough clout to get really get people going because Navy was undefeated. And, you know, there's a lot right. of Catholics here, man. There's yes. a lot of Catholics <laughs> in the states. Yes, they <laughs> are. Uh, but you know what? Let's go ahead and jump right into the right into the show. But before uh, we do that, I want to remind everyone: look, we do lives on Tuesday night. Lives at Tuesday night, nine thirty, nine thirty p.m. Eastern time. So be well, there. Uh, yeah, we just I mailed off the bonus to Alejandro. Alejandro got his bonus. Uh, Alex. We're winning our challenge for the month, and we're going to come up with another one this week. We'll announce it on Tuesday, the next challenge, and we'll have another giveaway for the month. So make sure you guys join our membership program uh, for our Tuesday, or basically for any time, but for Tuesday nights. And I also want to, John, you know what we've had a lot of requests for in the comments, because I read them, What's is that? we had a lot of requests for, hey, can we do a Q&A, but a live Q&A? So like, you know, Super Chats, this and that. I was like, you know, we just do a whole show based on Q&A. I think because this was a good pay-per-view, we'll kind of hash over a little bit more of that on tuesday but maybe we'll get into a little bit more questions from the q a and do it that join us in the live chats and uh, of course uh, i want to remind people that we have repartnered with OnlyFans, so you can heat us up over there uh, some extra content available on that platform and i'll be doing a live i'm sorry guys i missed the live that i announced on wednesday um i uh, had to pick up my my daughter from school so uh that got in the way that's not um, getting in the way that's more yeah. important Yes, but uh, but hey, you know, absolutely. And uh, outside of that, man, everyone drink element. Everybody drink element. Element keeps you keeps you hydrated, and keeps you salty. All right, John, let's get into the main event, man. 
Man, Let's go yeah. right away. Well, look, you got it. We, we we knew this was going to be a fantastic matchup. Both guys, obviously, Max is legendary now in the UFC. Tapuria has proven himself. He was fifteen and zero coming into this fight. We knew how good he was. I did say he's going to wrestle, and he wrestled. Yeah. You know, I loved how he he came out. He stood in the middle, like, you, "Let's go. You want to do it?" Max was smart. Gave him this little matador thing. Don't play another man's game. Make it your game that he's playing. That's the that's what the smart fighter does. But I I give it to Tapuria. The first round, he he had some good. He good action as far as I love the low leg kick, the calf kick that he was hitting. That was that was money the entire time. But Max ended up winning that first round, in my opinion. The second round was close. I actually had Max winning a lot. I know a lot of people are going to give it to Tapuria based upon commentary and stuff. But look, you got to go and he landed some good shot. But the best, the best blow of that round was what Tapuria kind of tried to shake off by putting his hands like you're a big deal. And you saw him backing off the entire time from that spinning uh, back kick that he landed to the body. That hurt him. You can see it hurt him. And that's the difference in that round. They both had good shots. Max landed more volume, but it doesn't matter in the end because Tapuria put a stamp on it with being the only man that ever knocked out Max Holloway. Just an incredible. <laughs> I'm going Holly, to Hollywood. Max Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, Hollywood. He's Max, he's Max Hollywood, man. You know, I, I don't want to do that to him, though. No. <laughs> it's a matter of, man, You look, Max has had an iron chin for a long time. He's taken big shots. But the two shots, the one that hurt him and the, the left hook that put him down, Josh, those are big shots. Yeah. Those are beautifully placed. You got to give it to Tapuria. He, he maintained his composure throughout the fight. There was moments where he was missing. Missing big at times, yeah. and Max was touching him. That can get frustrating. Man, being the champ, he was cool, calm, and collected throughout the fight. I'll tell you what, this is this guy is going to be just, you know, we've, we've talked about how good he is, but that fight against Volkanovsky, I was a little bit off on based upon, I thought Volkanovsky was brought back too fast after being knocked out by Islam. And so the, the knockout was like, okay, you knocked him out, but... You know, not enough time. This one, man, it's cements it. This guy, not only does he have that power, it's the way he goes about delivering it. He's He's got technical boxing. He's precise. He's calculated. He just looked freaking good, and you got to give it up for him. The man is a stud, and he's good everywhere, like we said. All right, look, all you guys that listen to the show on Tuesday, I want you guys to hear me out on something, okay? So, look. My my take on the Ilya Tapori and the Max fights, I thought Max was going to be able to outwork him. He was going to be able to use his experience against high level the competition yeah. and the range is going to be even though their their arms reach was the same. I it just doesn't it was, matter. Yeah, it, it didn't matter. It didn't matter the way because of the way Tapori moves his head offline and covers the distance really well by sliding both feet in and landing the straight shots. Um, great job by him. But hear me out on this. For me, it wasn't a big enough sample size to go ahead and say that I thought Ilya was going to win because you look back at some of his fights, right? Let's go all the way back to the Damon Jackson fight. Damon Jackson, pretty one-dimensional, more of a grappler, the leech, Absolutely. more, more one-dimensional, not great on the feet, but is a dog on the feet, will throw. Oh, hey, Damon throw. Jackson, one-dimensional fighter. That was his though. downfall. Ryan, Ryan Hall. <laughs> Ryan Hall, one-dimensional fighter, and he yeah. just smashed him. Okay, but one dimensional fighter. Jai Herbert, to me, one dimensional fighter. Very, but, but the, Jai Herbert was doing well in that yes. fight. Yes. Now he got knocked out, but he was doing well in that fight. And that was really what made me go, all right, well, you know what? I think Max, with all of his abilities, mm -hmm. he's going to get it done. Wasn't able to do it. But yeah, yep. I agree with you on the Jai Herbert. One Brian dimensional. Mitchell, Bryce Mitchell, one dimensional, one dimensional fighter. Dimensional. One dimensional fighter. Josh Emmett be, has become a one dimensional fighter. He utilizes his wrestling less, relies, relies on his power. And it could get him in trouble, but that was that went the distance. And Ilya looked a little bit tired in that third round. Was that three rounds? Five rounds? I think it was three. But you know, five rounds in that fourth in that fourth or fifth round, he started looking a little bit more tired in that fight. And I was thinking to myself, Max has more output. Max going to start touching with the jab, as we saw in the first round. The jab was having success in finding the range. And in a five round fight, I thought the jab would start to pay its dividends. Yeah. And so th that was me. Like with Josh, though, he's got power. He's not a one-dimensional fighter, but he fights one-dimensional now as he got older. All right? Uh, Volkanovsky coming off of the, the head kick knockout to Islam. 
I didn't put as much weight into him knocking out Volkanovski as as many people did. Yeah, I was like, look, he's coming off of a knockout. Like, you got to give your brain, your body, and your time to rest. It just time it gives it got to give it time to rest, and that's where we were at tonight. Though there's nothing that I can say that would change anything. You that need, guy, do you need a bigger good. sample size? No, no, I, I don't. I don't. I mean, maybe if it went into the fourth round, but he still looked as fresh as nails in that third round coming out. So, I mean, it just was one of those fights where I'm looking, I'm going, man, this this could have potentially ended up being like a great fight in rounds four and five. But the way he moved his head offline, the way he was making him pay when he could, when he could get there and slide in fast enough, he has quick hands. He's straight to the target. That's why they land with power. And they get there first before you can react. I, I just, I was very impressed. Oh, I was overall impressed. Now, I also had it, though. I had it 1-1. Yeah. I had Max win in the first. I had Ilya win in the second. And Max was looking good in the third until he got clipped with that straight right coming in. Literally, they they met in an exchange. Max kind of threw a jab, and he ste- he was getting ready to throw the jab and stepping into it, and then he hit him with the straight right hand, and that just put him back on his heels, and the rest was kind of history. I mean, the way that Ilya Teporia, though, what you'll find is some fighters, they, they get super excited. They, they just start, like, throwing rabbit punches and just missing and, and flailing about. Teporia was very clean with his striking, oh, came yeah. back, put the pressure – he visually could see everything that was happening around him. Yeah. I thought it was a fantastic performance and not just to the finish and not, I thought he had to overcome something too. Cause in the second or in the first round, he lost that round. At least I thought it was obvious. He lost that round, but in the second round he came back and I thought he did enough to win that round. You were different. You said the other okay. way, it was, regardless, close. it was a close round, yeah. but I felt like he was starting to now shape how the fight was going to go. Okay. Look, you got the first round. Okay. I had to figure you out. In the second round, he started to come on. Third round, Max was doing okay, but it was, you know, like it was still that position where you're like, we're only a minute, what, a minute 30, I think, into the first round. And he hit him with that, clipped him in that shot. So nice work. I, I, I there's nothing I could say. Ilya Zaporia, we always know, I knew he was the real deal. I just oh, yeah. didn't think against someone like Max. Well, or, you just, you hadn't seen enough to, to against that top yeah. flight competition that you're going. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen you. I've, I've seen you match up. I, I watched you match off against Volkanovski, and obviously he's top flight competition. Yeah. competition. It was just I was looking, saying, "Yeah, you know what? I didn't think that Alex took enough time off, and there was all the different things that were occurring." So it was like, yeah. "All right, you're not you're not getting the best sample of Volkanovski, but you are getting the best sample of Max Holloway." And boy, did you just make it look yeah. I mean, not easy, but man, did you put on a performance against a tough son of a bitch and a guy that we all know how good he is, and he's fighting right now at the top of his game. So, Ilya Tapuria, you are the featherweight champion for a reason, brother. Congratulations. That was a hell of a performance. Uh, yeah, outstanding performance. I don't think anyone can say anything else. Who is next, though, John, in that weight, in that weight class? Who so wants to be ranked? next? <laughs> yeah, this is very true. <laughs> They're saying I, I it's going to be Volkanovski's going to get the rematch. You know, and, and that's, yes. but you got to be honest when you're looking at, there's that drop off and you can sit there and say, well, you got Diego Lopez sitting there, you know, coming off of a couple of, you know, really nice wins and everything. Mm-hmm. And yeah, but I t- I'm being honest. I don't think Diego is going to do well. Diego's got power in his stand up, but he's got a lot of holes as far as the technical application of how he delivers it mm-hmm. and uh, brings it more, you know, like you're saying, he. Th- Tapuria throws things straight down the you know the pipe. It gets there fast and it's on target, and that's why it has power. You know, Lopez tends to to wing the shots around the sides a lot. It's uh, on the ground. Obviously, he's really good, but we've seen Tapuria go against really good jujitsu guys, and he does yeah. just fine in that situation. So, I don't know who you've got in there that right now that I say, oh, this is the guy that you know, this is the one that can that can push the envelope on him. I, don't I mean, the ones is. that I really would like to see him fight, though, would be Diego Lopez, obviously. Yeah, um, one. And, and I want to see him fight Evaloff. That'd be another. And I also want to get into the brand, the uh, Arnold Allen fight. That's another one. So th- those are the guys I'd like to probably try to see him fight. Now, I know Aljo's there. He's lurking. You know, but I mean, that's still, still I, I don't know. I'm being honest. You know, and I, I, I really like Aljo. I like his skill set. But the stand-up is what scares yeah. me in that matchup with Aljo. Aljo's got the wrestling and he's got the ground game mm-hmm. to compete with anybody. Stand up wise, I yeah. don't know how he matches up against Tapuria. That's not great. 
Well, I mean, the, like I'm just throwing out guys that I feel like would yeah. be probably headed to the top here shortly to get a you shot. Could, at but it. you could you could definitely sell that Aljo fight. You know, former oh, could, champion yeah. coming up at 145, undefeated at 145. Yeah, there's all kinds of things there. So, yep. I mean, there's yeah, there's things to be said there. I mean, but like, look, you're looking at Diego probably, Evaloff, and then Arnold Allen, and then probably Aljo. Those are the guys I think right now that are going to be pushing him for that title shot. So it's up to those four guys to get something done, you know, against another top level comp uh, competitor and get that win. Yeah. They got their hands full. <laughs> they, they sure do. <laughs> they sure do. I mean, like, look, there's already talk though. He was talking about, Oh, you know, I could probably go up to one eight, one fifty five. There's guys right now that he should be fighting and look good, make that money, do your thing. And if they end up going to Spain, I mean, that's good. I, I could see them fighting Volkanovsky there in Spain. Yeah. That'd be a big deal. Yeah, no, that'd be great. But I, I, I'm being honest. Tapuria should not go to 155. You know, at 145, you know, he looks good at that weight, but mm -hmm. he is he does not have the frame of a 155 pound fighter. I mean, when, Max when, looked huge against him in the, absolutely. the cage today. You know, now I'm not saying that he can't compete with him, but when you get into that top level and then you're moving that that much more weight, yes, you're weighing the same, but it's it takes time to put that weight on the right way and everything. I don't know. I just look at it and I go. It just doesn't seem like the smart move for him. He's got what? What is wrong with clearing out a damn division? <laughs> you know, I don't. I don't get it anymore. But you but, know what it is, John. Someone has two titles. Staying. Yeah. At the so I time. want two titles. Yeah, you got to get two titles, man. You want to be considered somebody now, like you know, the top guys. It was the guys that are chasing two titles. I mean, shit. Alex Bahia is going to be chasing three here shortly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, next fight, John. Oh, all right. We had. Robert Whitaker taking on Kamzat Shemaev in what uh, was a fight that was delayed based upon health issues and things like that. Man, I'll tell you what. You know, and I, I, I texted to you, no matter what you want to say, man, Kamzat Shemaev is a first-round monster. And I said that before he got the finish because, look, I know how good Robert Whitaker is. You know how good Robert Whitaker is. I've been in the cage with Robert Whitaker. He is a special athlete. He is damn good. And he had no answers. I, he was doing everything he could, you know, to get himself up to his feet at times. Man, Chemayev had the answer to every, you know, movement that he did. He wrote it out. He, you know, ended up back in a better position. You just look at, you know, the, the shot that he took, Josh. You yeah. don't take those shots in MMA anymore, you know, especially against someone that can wrestle. Yeah. And Robert Whitaker can wrestle. That damn change of levels and shot for the double leg was crazy far away, and he got in deep. So, I mean, he's he's got quickness in his wrestling. He The one thing that I'll say he does beautifully, he changes angles incredibly well he will turn a corner on anyone to get to the right angle to, to be able to drive and make himself heavy and have more strength you know i know people you you look at body types and you think oh this guy's stronger it's not a matter of how much weight they can move it's how they move it and shamayev understands how to move that weight he is just so yeah. good at he he looks he looks like a damn predator when he's getting ready to fight with his eyes and the way he's like a wolf, you know, and he just absolutely showed again that first round, you know, that's why we took him. This, you know, he was a plus 800. It's like, Hey, he could win it in the first round. Yeah. You know, and, uh, I don't know anybody that's going to win the first round against that guy, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the, in the middleweight division stand by. I don't think there is anyone now. If it gets into later rounds, we've seen a different guy. We've seen that he does slow down, but you got to make it through the first round. This is true. I mean, I, look, and I, I know after we got done talking about this on Tuesday for the um, for the fight breakdown on it, I, I saw obviously I go through the comments. People are talking like, "Hey, man, like, why do you hate Shemayev? You're always picking against him, this and that." No, it's not a hate Shemayev thing. I love what he's done, man. But look, let's go through this again. I'm and bear with me right here, okay? Kind of follow along. He barely gets past uh, Kamaru Usman after having a full camp and Usman coming off the couch. And let's not forget, even though Usman had a good performance against him, he's still a 70-pounder. Okay, Even though he can fight at 85, we all know he can. He just showed it. He proved against uh, Hamza. But he's a 170-pounder. Then you go to Kevin Holland, who is at 170 now. 
Okay, and when they fought, I believe that Kevin Holland had made the weight already at 170 and then was going and basically fought him at 180, I believe, correct? Or 185? Did they agree on 185? I think it ended up at 185. I, don't think I, think it it ended, I thought they agreed on 180 or whatever. They might have. Anyways, yeah, but whatever it was, now Kevin Holland is a 170-pounder. Gilbert Burns, 170-pounder. Okay, great 170-pounder. Mm -hmm. And it's fought for the title, but he's still 170-pounder. Now, that was a fight that he made the weight on, I believe. He made that weight on in the Gilbert Burns fight. No, he did. He did. So then he missed the Kevin Holland weight action stuff that went on there. The Kamaru Usman fight, a, a short notice fight. These are all three 170 pounders. He made the weight against uh, uh, Li Jiang. He that fought him as well. And he he, he ragdolled him. No one's questioning his abilities. But to say that he gets a title shot off of beating a bunch of 70 pounders in the He's got to get the title shot. I, I know he is. <laughs> okay. I, I, I can just, you can just feel it in the room. Oh yeah, but the thing is, Joe John, like he's literally beat a bunch of seventy pounders, but was supposed to be fighting at eighty five, and now he's getting he's not getting a title shot at one seventy. He's getting a title shot at one eighty five. It doesn't make sense to me. Like I'm not saying that he's not skilled, and I'm also saying that in that fight with Gilbert Burns, he was exhausted, and he was yeah. also exhausted in the Kamar Usman fight, who is a seven a one seventy pounder. Yeah. So look, I'm not taking away what he did today because what he did today spoke for itself. Absolutely fantastic performance, but we've seen this before where he's dominated for round one like this. Had that miss happen, you know, or whatever it was with the jaw of Robert Whitaker not happened, he probably would have survived the round. And we would we be the, in the same position? Oh, broken. yeah, oh, broken or just look okay, yeah, something, huh? I don't know, it looks, that looks broken. Can you tell us what it is? I think dislocated. That's what they okay. said. Well, dislocated right. is at the hinge. It's not in the front. Yeah, it's not there in the front. Normally, in the front, it would be like a break yeah, here break in the front, and that's what it causes doctor. your. That's what I'm causes your doctor. teeth. Come on, George, you're a doctor. Tell everyone when you see the mouth like that. It normally it's like normally a break because the teeth will start yes, to separate. Teeth start to no. yeah move around. One gets tired, so my, taller my than the on, other. My take on Chemaev is there wasn't a big enough sample size. It guys at 185 tonight was a good way for him to prove it and print that he deserves a title shot. But I still, you still got two guys ahead of him. I believe you've got um, Sean Strickland and you've got uh, Izzy. I I honestly believe he should probably fight the loser of the title shot that's going to happen next. That's my honest opinion. Um, who's going to drag him into the deeper water so we can see if he can perform? I, I, look, if you guys want to fight him at, at, for the title, have at it. It doesn't bother me at all. Like it doesn't. I, I'm actually kind of encouraged to see him and DDP fight. That'd be a great fight. Yeah. DDP's gonna have to stop his takedowns. We've seen DDP get tired. We've seen. But what we've also seen is Hamzat's been able to bully people around with his wrestling, and he's a big guy for 185. Also, do you see him standing he next barely, to Robert Whitaker? He barely he's made cool. weight. He yeah, but he had problems making huge. weight. Yeah, he's huge though, John. Yeah, and absolutely. when you saw him standing in front of Whitaker, I was like, oh, Whitaker used to be a 70 pounder too. That's the yes. other thing. Uh, he's now put the weight yeah, on. Yeah, but he's been a 185. He's been an 85 pounder for a long time. I get it. Overall, though, great performance tonight by him. Uh, dominant position. Whatever happened in, in the, to the jaw chin, he caused it. So yep. good on him. I mean, this was a great. This was a great performance. Something I can say. Okay, look, we've seen this part. But the thing is, if I'm somebody, if I'm a promoter, I'm like, I've seen him win this way before. But what I haven't seen is how what he how he gets it done in the third, fourth, and fifth. Because if I go based off of the Kamaru Usman position where he started losing in that third round because he was exhausted. It's kind of one of those, it's one of those fights where um, I got to check and see. I can go back and take a look at it and see. Yeah, I, I totally understand the way you look at it, but you, you got to admit, he brings an excitement to that weight class that really hasn't been around for very long, you know, very much. You had Anderson Silva dominating the weight class for a long time. He had, there was a ton of excitement over him. Then Izzy was kind of dominating it, and you kind of got that. He's the next guy. And I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to take anything away from Sean or DDP or any of them. You know, great fighters, but yeah. don't have that exact aura no. that Chemayev is bringing. And so, you know, if if the UFC put him in right now, I understand. You know, I totally understand. It, it makes sense. You ride with what is hot. And yeah, the guy is he's hot. I agree. I agree. And, you know, let's not forget that there's a lot of money being poured in right now from the Middle East to have top level fighters and have them present themselves, you know, to be on these high up on the pay-per-views or, you know, high up on main card, whatever it is. And 
there's a there's a reason why. I mean, like, and he's can perform, man. He can perform. I just want to see him get tested in that third, fourth, fifth round in a real in a title fight, in a five round title fight. Did he not say he's living in Abu Dhabi now? I think he did. Yeah. Yep, that's what I got. So, so I mean, good on they, him. Though, they, de- but- they definitely are going to have him you know him on the card instead yeah. of somebody else. Yeah, I mean, I want to see I want to see him, uh, you know, in a in, whether a title fight or another five round uh, main event. Uh, against either Izzy or Sean, if Sean loses, or DDP if he loses, whoever loses the title shot coming up next, I'd like to see him fight that person. Okay, whoever that is. All right, we had Magomed Ankalaev taking on Alexander Rakic, and like I said, if you're gonna go on a on a bathroom break, this is the perfect time uh, to go when you're watching Ankalaev fight because I I, I don't want to say anything bad about it because he <clears throat> like he put on a good performance, he put pressure. He went after him. Josh, there's just so much more that this guy can do. He won't do it. This is crazy. Does it remind you of someone named John Fitch? Oh, my God. Does it not? Just in reverse. Just in reverse. You know? It's one yeah. of those. You look and you go, I know you're a good fighter. I can. Yeah. I will never, ever say anything but that. I, I respect your skill set. There's no doubt in my mind you're one of the better guys in the world at your weight class. But you can absolutely beat insomnia, mm-hmm. and it's just the it's just the way you go about fighting. Yeah, I mean, I don't. <clears throat> Rakic, I think I I had seen the preview that he was able to get potentially get like a title shot if he won this fight, and I'm like, I I don't see it. I didn't see Rakic or Ankalaev. He, he, no, Rakic also. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, I was told that he, neither one know, would he, deserve in it. his interviews before. He's like, yeah, all right, if I win this fight, I'm getting a title shot. I'm like. I mean, they. I know they like him, and him being put in these situ- situations. But both of them, though, it was a it was basically like a light sparring session for both. And the yeah. fact that I, I think I had heard DC telling me that or saying that that uh, Rackets Corner was saying they were up by two rounds. I had a thirty twenty seven for Uncle Live, unless that, I missed something. I first had a, round, the, oh, fir- the first the first round, Rackett won the round, and it was based upon. He had he had a lot more volume. Ankalaev was chasing, but he wasn't throwing. Mm, yeah. And so when you take a look at the you know basic how many shots landed and how many thrown, it was the, a, a large size difference, and yeah. that's where Ankalaev in the second round started at least throwing more. Yeah. But and, and Rakic just running, you know, as far as he he has the ability to stop someone in their tracks and push them back, and in this case, just wouldn't do it enough. Oh. But. <clears throat> no, the thing with Uncle Live when I was looking at the Bet US odds, man, they had it like if it went if it went to a decision, it was like a minus, like two twenty. Yeah. So it was they definitely thought that Uncle Live was going to take this fight to decision and win. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. And how much did he wrestle? <laughs> Defensive wrestling. That was it. Yeah. You know, that's just, that's, that's the problem with it. You know, <clears throat> The the one thing you got to figure out in MMA, you're allowed to use all these different skill sets. And the better off you are, Adam, the better off you're going to be at, at winning your fight. And the more that you can create a, a problem for your opponent in making them have to deal with more things, the better off you're going to be. Why would you limit it just to a, a kickboxing yeah. match? <clears throat> Doesn't make no sense. Idea. <clears throat> yeah, if you want to do that, go fight in glory. That's it. That's it. <clears throat> All right, we had Lerone Murphy taking on Dan 50K E Gay. I really enjoyed the fight, though. I thought it was a good fight. I thought uh, Dan E Gay won the first round. I thought Lerone Murphy won the second round. And it all came down to the third round. And my biggest problem with what Dan E Gay did is he's, he's grappling, but he's not doing any damage and he's not getting any submission attempts. And so it's just more time. And as soon as Murphy ends up landing some good shots near the end. It's like, damn, they're going to give him the round. And that's what happened. Yeah, I had Dan win in the fight, but I know. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. But I mean, it, it is what it is. I mean, Dan definitely could have done more when he was in the top position. He was slowing down quite a bit in that second round. He, he was doing so good with his yeah. pressure in the first round. Mm-hmm. And in the second round, just went, okay, I don't know what hurt him, but something did that got him away from stepping forward and in, continue with that pressure. And he started going towards being the guy getting pushed back. Yeah. And it all just started going away from him in that second round. 
Yeah, with a really good striker, you can't afford to be the one on your back hill. You've got to be crushing that space. Go back and watch the fight with Fedor Milianenko and uh, Mirko Krokop. Oh, yeah. Mirko just walked him down and just covered. Whoa, 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 whoa. Fedor. <laughs> Fedor just walked him down. It was cutting the in, not, let, not even allowing him to get the kicks off. And that was what that was when Krokop was just killing everybody. Yeah. Everyone was, you know, trying to move away from Krokop, and especially that left high kick. Yeah. And Fedor was the one that said, no, no, we go, we go towards him, and that killed him. Yep. Went that, right at it. That wrote the blueprint on how everyone then fought Krokop from that point forward. Yeah, exactly. No reason to be afraid of him. His boxing was never that great. He had some power, but it was always about his kicks and how flexible he was to get it up there. And fast. <clears throat> yeah, extremely fast. Yeah. Um, look, I, I had I had Larone uh, losing that fight. It was a close fight. I'm a Dan Ige homer, though. Yeah. He's allowed me very upfront with you guys. But uh, but it look, was close. I wasn't, it was close. You, you can't you can't be upset either way. No, I, I just I had Dan win the fight because of the control in the top position. I do agree with you though; he could have done more, whether yeah. chasing submissions or posturing for elbows, something along those lines. He could have done something a little bit more, but he didn't. Um, just controlling the top position sometimes is not enough, and sometimes it is. But uh, today wasn't the day. Yep. All right, we had the bullet Shara Magomedov taking on Armin Petrosian to start the main card. Uh, this is one where you're taking a look at two guys that are you know, very good in the stand-up. Uh, Petrosian tends to tail off. We've seen it in the past. Shara continues to kind of build as he's going, and that's what really happened. But he landed. I've never, I'm have never. i being honest. I've never seen a double spin. Like nah. this. Both left, right, you know, and it was like, are you, really? Okay, yeah. that was a, really well done. Caught him good, hurt him. Uh you know, I I enjoy watching Shara fight. He's fun to watch. He's busy. You know, he he tries to bring a lot of uh, volume out. He lands good hard uh, shots at times. He touches at other times. I thought it was a, a a nice win against a guy who we know in the stand up, and that's really where the fight was. We know he's a good stand up fighter. Yeah, absolutely. I thought Shara. Um, he's still showing like his weaknesses, John. I don't know if yes. it's because. He's still relatively young in the sport. I mean, he's got, he has, he's very skilled. The speed, the way he kind of lets you come in a little bit, and then he'll faint a little bit. Counters he well. React. He counters very well. Yeah. Speed of his kicks, you could tell that he's got some, he's got some power behind him. The hands are a little wild and sloppy, but I mean, they're still, they're still there. They're still, the, they can still be used uh, to create um, issues if they hide them behind the kicks or hide the kicks behind the punches. So. Overall, though, I thought it was a – I knew it was going to be a very uh, close contested fight up until the finish, but it was one of those things where Petrosian is is that next level of competition that they needed to see. The UFC, I feel like, is taking the Conor McGregor approach with with Shara, um, giving him guys that are stand-up guys mainly that have a little bit of grappling, have some wrestling, not really. We're going to see what happens. And for me, I'm I'm not fully sold on him yet. I'm like the Teddy Bruschi of this whole uh, podcast, man. I feel like I just, I'm, I just am very conservative before I start crowning these guys to be what they, what everybody wants to make them. Um, I've gone down that road before too, too soon, too fast sometimes, and I'm just like, damn, what was I thinking? You know, like I, I, I just believed, I believed. But in this thing, look, there's no doubt about his skills on his feet. Uh, he's fun to watch, that's for sure, because he leaves himself open to get countered, as well as you know throwing with hard power. And he's like and watching a kick. ginger caveman. <laughs> <laughs> he's good though, man. He's very good, and he's fun. That's the other yeah, thing too. He is. Is he's fun, so I can see what the the push is on him. Um, you know, there's a good story behind him too. He's got one eye. He still has great performances. I mean, like he's having great. He's getting better. It seems like every fight, getting more relaxed out there. You know, I, I, I talked. Agree. to... I talked about, I don't know what the UFC is going to do with him, but I'll tell you what, if there's one thing that he's doing for every one-eyed fighter out there, and there are a couple, he's opening up people's eyes to, well, maybe we can allow, you know, the, guy, the guys like Dre yeah. Miley, who's out here in Knoxville and stuff, you know, who's, you know, working his ass off to get better and get fights and has a hard time because he's in the States. You know, this guy is at least proving, hey, yes, they can fight and you should allow them to fight. And a very nice win by Shara Margamana. Yeah, great great job, man. Great job. Uh, next fight. Uh, we had Ibo Aslan taking on Rafael Sequeria. And I'll tell you what. 
<laughs> you know, Ebo is that guy that we've we've seen fight in the UFC before. He came out of the Dana White's Contender Series. We know he's got power. Had a had a tough fight in his first fight in the UFC, but you know, ended up getting the win. He's he went took himself to Extreme Couture. I watched him training there. Um, he's wanted to work on his defensive wrestling, and everything, because he's got big power. And boy, he had big power in this fight right yeah. away. He showed that power. He put a undefeated fighter just down with some heavy shots and mm -hmm. uh i mean did exactly what he's supposed to do this guy's gonna be again you're looking at 205 pounds it's a good infusion of young talent with him coming up <laughs> that's exciting he's exciting because he's got power yeah i mean he's got power he, he just has like a, kind of that caveman approach though so i think people are like okay look, oh, yeah. let's see what the ceiling is on him is he going to be somebody that just comes out tries to always knock somebody out then is he gasses and gets tired and move on to the fight but for right now, let's enjoy it. Yeah. Let's enjoy these kind of fights because as they start to get tougher for him, he's either going to go out on his shield or he's going to put somebody out on theirs. So it makes for some fun fights for us as fans. I don't know how far he can make a run at it in the light heavyweight division. It's not a stacked division right now. No, I mean, look, he's 14 and one right now. Mm -hmm. He's, yeah, he's doing his thing. He's getting better. He's learning. And anytime you're getting better in every performance you go into, you're a little bit better for that next performance. That's what you're looking at and right now. That's what he's doing. So. Yep. <clears throat> Jeff uh, Neal yeah. taking on RDA. And unfortunately, this is the 40-year-old version of RDA. And I was worried about, you know, Jeff Neal having a little bit of the power advantage, the speed advantage. Obviously, he doesn't have the ground advantage over RDA, but you got to get it there. And it never even went there. You, know, you could see mm -hmm. right away that the power of Neal got – uh, Rafael's attention and then a knee injury uh, somewhere in there happened with him stepping back and popped his knee and that was the end of the fight. Yeah. Knock, knocked him down basically twice. Yeah, I mean, like for me, I thought that he would come out and wrestle right off the bat, but I also thought that if the wrestling would lead to some calf kicks, um, <clears throat> given that they're both opposite side partners, I believe. So like they're both left-handed, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so they're both absolutely. left handed. I was expecting the calf kicks to come out a little bit more. Um, get them well, started early. Yeah. You know, RDA is very good at attacking that front leg on someone mm -hmm. that's a standard orthodox fighter. And it's like it almost threw him off. You could see, Maybe. like, you know, having that guy, another guy that's a southpaw. I mean, because, like I said, like, hear me out. Wait, if you throw the calf kicks, John, and he gets taken down, I think Jeff Neal's like, okay, get back up. So there's really no risk of him coming down into your guard. Maybe a little bit, but he took him I mean, down. But I'm saying, no, what I'm saying though is if he throws the calf kick, if he throws the calf kick and he starts adding up, what's Jeff Neal gonna do? He's gonna have to start trying to get this fight on the outside, away from those calf kicks, or he's gonna have to go all the way in and crush the space. I just looked at RDA as being somebody that he would use a little bit more fighter IQ, didn't have enough time to really to figure it out. Um, but it didn't look good though right off the bat. You just saw Jeff Neal with the speed a little bit, and obviously the power was going to be too much. But I was expecting to see more out of RDA in terms of the calf kicks as well as the wrestling. Yeah, I mean, it's just you, you just got to be honest with it. This is the time, and especially when you're in that 170 down, mm -hmm. you know, 40 years of age, it is not easy to be fighting in the UFC. Not no. easy. Not at all. My farm needs the earth, the air, and the water. I get my energy going on Element Electrolyte Drink Mix. Clean, good-tasting energy that feeds me like I feed my plants and animals. And after a long day on the tractor, when it's time to shoot the podcast, I drink Element so that I can stay energized and stay salty. Let's get it on. All right, we had Mat Mateus Rabecki taking on Orobale. I think it's Orobai. 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 And uh, what a fight. God damn, this, these guys went after it. You know, Rebecca was coming off of a loss. Um, it was the, a fight that he got, you know, his eyes got closed up in that thing and stuff. And so he had came out with a, a lot of intensity. Man, he was just throwing everything with everything he had at the beginning i was like eh, that's not a good way of uh lasting in the fight but you know ended up getting the nice goose egg under orlebi's eye 
Uh, he ended up getting the headbutt cut. It, it centered out, but man, these guys went after it. You talk about when when you talk about what what do you want to see in a fight? I want to see that. I want to see two guys going for it. I want to see guys that are you know not hanging back when all of a sudden you know oh they have a little advantage in the round, so I'm going to hang back. Just going after finishing, going after trying to get the knockout, going after the ground, and go, and you know just the the reversals and everything. Just I loved everything that happened in that fight. Great fight. Yeah, these guys just came in and just laid it all on the line. This is what you want to see from two guys like this, you know, from the headbutt clash and the swollen eye. I love it when doctors come in and you know the guy can't see. They go, okay, how many fingers am I holding up? <laughs> Even, no matter what, just always guess two. Like it's, it's always the same number. Remember when, your parents, when you were younger? Like, how many are you holding up? I'm holding up two. Okay, like it's it's just hilarious. It's always the same number. They is. never do one. They never do four. They never, you know, it's like, it's just funny. It's always two. How many fingers am I holding up? Two. Yeah, that's true. You know, he could, you knew, you could tell that Orobai couldn't see shit. <laughs> He's like, uh, <laughs> two, two. Uh, but Rebecca had a good fight, man. The two of them got after each other. It was very entertaining. It was a bloodbath. Nasty blood everywhere from the head cut. And then obviously a couple little abrasions other places. But man. It was overall just a great performance and fight by both fighters. It was fun to watch. That when you buy when you buy a ticket to go sit in the arena and watch fights, that's what you're that's hoping the, to see. That's what you're looking for. You're like, damn, this is this is this is why I spent this, this is money awesome. Out here. Yeah, and like the crowd, the yeah. the loud music as you know before they when they're walking in, like that's what you go for. That's that's what, it. like, it's fun to be there at those type of events. So yeah. they got their money worth for that fight. Absolutely. We had Abus Magomedov taking on Bruno Ferreira. I'll tell you what, Abus is a guy that, you know, he's what it's weird because this guy's got zero body fat. All right. <laughs> I and what I'm what I'm saying, but he gets tired. Yeah. And he was tired of that. And I give him credit, man. He hung in there. But you can tell by the end of that fight, he goes, I'm done. Just kidding. anyway, it's a beautiful submission. He got the arm triangle. But the, and there was a moment there where I thought. I thought Fierro was starting to take over in the fight, and he was getting him. I th it looked like a boost was going to break, and they got to be the end of the second round. And I thought, oh no, Fierro's going to win this fight. And a boost goes out there, gets the takedown, and from that point goes to the choke. I got to give him credit, but there's something in his gas tank. He's got to do something when it comes to the cardio to make his body get past that point, because it's, I've seen it too many times with him. He's good. He's talented. But he gets tired, and when it, whenever you have that, and I'll be the first one to say I'm one of those guys like that, man. I, I can go, and then all of a sudden, fall off the cliff. You know, you were never that guy. You were that guy that could just fucking run and go, and it makes a difference. It just yeah. makes a difference. I kind of feel like there's something to do with the, he might be too lean, John. Maybe there's guys that are they if they are too lean, they just don't have enough energy in their muscles to burn for that period of time. Enough glucose, he, he yeah. yeah he, he looked fantastic in the first round, and then and then uh, Fajeda started coming back in the second. Yep, you know, and then in the third, he just he was tired too, <clears throat> and this, the the sheer body size I think is what won about a boost that fight. Got to the top position and was able to control him with his weight and his size because Fajeda was tired too. Overall, though, you just got to make I don't know what kind of change it can make. Maybe put some more I don't know put put some more more uh, meals or carbs or something in his diet to give him that energy for his muscles to burn i mean i, I just I, I see that he potentially might be someone that overtrains a little bit because he's always super lean and he's sometimes lean. when they're super lean they also look smooth because they are overtrained or he's or he is also super lean and then can, then tries to make the weight getting the weight down because he looked huge and i know i guess bruno's not that big of a guy yeah he's not height wise and things like that but he does remind me of uh, Calvin Gaslam, is like they were talking about. <clears throat> but uh, Abus is his size, like his shoulder Abus size. Is six foot two. High, yeah, he's a big guy. He's a really big guy for that weight. And so um, it might be a little bit of the weight cut, too, mixed in with how lean he is. Look, there, I've seen some of the chubbiest guys go out there and have cardio for, day, for days. Paul Bonatello. Okay, the guy had the biggest gut in the world, but that dude, Roy, he could Roy run, Nelson, he could go Roy Nelson, yeah, this guy's a good. It wasn't so much they even had like the grit; they just they just had the energy. Yeah, they just had a gas tank. Yeah, it, it was all tank. in the front too. It was all in the belly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but man, it was to me, it was uh, 
a good performance for Abus. He had to come back in the third, and I felt like it was 1-1 going into the third. I thought he dominated the third. Obviously, got the finish. Yep. But um, but overall, though, good. Good on him, man. Next fight. All right, we had Kenny Njuku taking on Chris Barnett. Another man that's got a large gas tank in the middle of him right there, that belly. But where was it that Chris Barnett hurt himself? Was it the the kick? Was it the stomp at the beginning? Where was it that it happened? Somehow, he hurt his hamstring. You could see it. And he had nothing but, you know, downhill effects from it, from whenever it happened. And it looked to me like it had to be that kick. You know, when I see NFL players, you know, they jump up and down off of a sack or something. I've seen guys on the NFL oh, yeah. field jump up and down and they tear their knee out. Oh, yeah. Just little things. You know, like when I we talk about this, too, with the fighters that do the backflips off the top of the cage. Yeah, all the time. Like, why? <laughs> why? Like, you, you know, want to fight. I get it. You're excited. But then do you, you remember? Wrong. Do you remember how high Kevin Randleman could do a standing jump? Yeah. I mean, Kevin Randall. I mean, we're talking right in the NBA. Mm-hmm. Kevin Randleman was not a tall guy. When that guy would start bouncing and jumping and it would yeah. get higher and higher. And one time he came down and landed and he, he basically tore his quad, you know, and, and he fought the whole fight with it. <laughs> but Kevin Randall was, he was a monster and he was crazy as hell. But man, you talk about explosive, but yeah, guys getting hurt. Remember Johnny Walker doing the, you yep. the, you did the, the worm. Crawl. Yeah. The crawl. <laughs> when he freaking, he separated his shoulder. You know, it's like, oh man, don't hurt yourself. Yeah. But, Happens, happens it's it's why i just i get cringe every time i see these guys doing these things i'm like man like especially the guys do the backflips off the, the side of the oh, fence yeah. the, the gaiches and alvarez yeah i'm like I've seen, him, I've seen eddie do his in person actually i've oh, yeah. seen justin do or gaichi do his as well in person but man they get so high it's not like just let me just do it real quick off the edge no no they jump no, up no, it's jumping and up then, uh, yeah. yeah you're on a six foot fence let me jump no, up and have my feet go way up and so I can land, and it's like, oh, I'll never forget Darian Call. That shit. I don't. Like, literally, <laughs> you, you don't. You just you just jump in there and do it. Yeah, yeah you're used to doing a backflip. Darian, you remember Darian Caldwell from yes. uh, Bellator? He at one time, uh, I can't remember exactly which fight it was, but he did a backflip off of the cage onto the camera yep. person. Uh huh. Right, camera person was out forever. Sued She's the company. Still out. Yeah, super She's company, out. everything. Yeah, yeah. It's like, don't do it. I don't know how you could sue the company for that. Don't ask me. Don't ask me. I have no idea. No idea. Don't ask me. You're, you're in the cage. You're the camera person. It happens. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, hold on. No, the best is you're the camera person and your camera's on him. <laughs> <laughs> you got yourself in that position. Hey, look. Whoa, that's. Whoa. Oh shit! Oh, oh. great uh, shot. Let me use that. Uh, let me use that. Yeah. It's one of those uh, great shot. <laughs> Next fight. All right. We had Farid Basharat taking on Victor Hugo. This is actually a really good fight. Yeah, it was. I, I enjoyed this fight. This is one of those ones where you could, you want to talk about, when we talk about guys overextending and making mistakes that lead to them losing the fight, let me introduce you to Mr. Victor Hugo. Because Bash, Basharat was, uh, you know, obviously he's technically really good and he's a good fighter. And he was doing well in the beginning. And then it's, he started getting taken over. And Hugo started making huge mistakes that overextended and put him in bad positions. And he'd work his way out of it. And then overextend, boom, put himself in bad position. And Basharat, would, that's how he won the fight. I mean, he just, you know, he definitely won the fight. No doubt about it. But you've got to be smart about your attacks and and how you are going to attack and and don't overthrow and don't put too much on it touch your opponent if you know you're having problems getting to him don't wind up and try to hit him with the home run shot go for the single yeah basra is just a skillful fighter and he's very very high fight iq you can see his brain out there working how could i exploit your weaknesses without taking too many risks yeah I thought he fought fantastic, man. He, he still did. He looked great. He looked fantastic. There's nothing I can take it. Hugo, he had opportunities that could have maybe sort of changed in the dynamic of the fight. Just yeah. didn't do it. Just yeah. didn't fall through. Threw him all away. Yeah. Uh, next fight, John. All right. We had a comeback with Ismail. <laughs> I, I, I always screw up his name. 
Nardiev. 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 Yeah. Nardiev. Going up against Bruno Silva. Thank God for Bruno Silva's name. I love it. But Nardiev, he actually looked really good. He did. You know, he'd been, been off for a while, came back, very composed, looked good in the stand up, utilized wrestling. And, and this is what I'm talking about. Look, he made it to where Bruno Silva had a lot to deal with in the fight. And that's what ended up basically just making the fight difficult for Silva. You know, I think what I think what made the fight difficult for Silva is his mind and all of his interviews, John, were about Chris Weidman and his fight with Poetan and how it had nothing to do with his opponent that he was getting in front of. It's crazy. Like, and then when he got out there, you could hear Anik going, he just seems like he doesn't want to be out there. No, because his all week he was complaining about those guys and fights that slipped oh, well, away. Oh, he's complaining about going, the commentary too. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, so, the commentary. So it's, yeah. it just comes down to you weren't focused on the guy that was you were going to have to face and the one that's sitting in front of you right now whooping your ass. So that's what happened. True. He looked almost a, almost like he was irritated that he was out there having to fight this guy. Yeah. Against the fence, there was no sense of urgency to get his back off the fence. He really, I mean, I don't want to say he didn't fight hard because it takes a lot, you know, to go the distance with anybody. But he just didn't, he didn't look like he really cared to be there. Yeah. But it was a nice return for Nurdiev, mm -hmm. uh, who was in the UFC before, now comes back. Uh, looked really good and put on a very good performance against him. So, I mean, hats off to him. He was part of a guy. I, I, I saw that guy's ticket, and he had Nerdiev against mm -hmm. Silva for the decision. Pulled off two others for a parlay that only Maddie paid Maddie. out hundred hundred thousand dollars off of a twenty two hundred and fifty dollar bet. Wow, that was I was I did the show with him yesterday, Maddie Betts. Yeah, for the Bet US TV, it was awesome, nice. man. Matty was he, he's wild though, John. I, some of his bets, I was like, but then again, look at me tonight. I wouldn't have taken my bets either. <laughs> I would have. Come on, you would have come out a winner just with the one with Chamaya. Yeah, just we with had the that one. one. You're right. So. Yeah, especially the first round submission one. I think. All right, was. we had Fakran Dinov taking on Carlos Neal. There was Leal. There was some uh, controversy in this. The uh, the uh, commentary team believed that Leo won that 29-28 where Fakrandinov ended up walking away with the unanimous decision win. Fakrandinov had some some nice choice words for uh, the commentaries also. Oh, did he? Yeah. <laughs> so him, yeah, same thing. Uh, he was saying, I don't know what those guys were watching. Da, da, da. But I, look, in all fairness, I didn't see the fight, John. I missed it. And so give me, I had George text in. What were your thoughts on it? Did you see it? <laughs> George, what did you think? We're bringing you in, man. It's your chance. Go. It was a robbery. That's what it was. Was, it was, a was a robbery. It was a robbery. There was a lot of people saying that Fakhradinov should have lost that fight. I it thought it was 29-28 for Leo. Okay. Well, anyways, I uh, guess uh, if you guys had a lot of back knee. His opponent did have a lot of back knee. That could have yeah. been the judge's eyes. <laughs> uh, well, hey, if you guys want to leave your comments down below, let us know who you thought won that fight and uh, let us know. And uh, John, what else do we have here? George, I put a couple things into the news. Let's let's talk something real quick on some news talk real quick. I, I got something personal I want to ask. We don't want to talk about your personal life, George. Well, it's not like oh. I was listening to the <laughs> I was listening to the Joe Rogan companion, and they, Joe uh, Eddie Bravo and Brendan were discussing what was the more influential time for the UFC. Was it when UFC 2 happened and it was Royce and Frank? Or was it when after the tough finale on Spike when Stefan Bonner and uh, Forrest Griffin fought? What was more influential in blowing up the UFC? Neither one of those. <laughs> gotcha. I, I, I can make, John, you can probably make an argument like what? I can for, for, the, uh, for the Forrest and Stefan Bonner fight. Absolutely, I can make an argument for that being the most influential uh, part of this sport. But you, you'd have to start it off with Hoist and the way he was able to get things done in the very first UFC one, being so, the smaller guy amongst all these guys that just looked the part and had the names behind them and all this stuff. The, the BJJ martial arts, no one knew of it until that moment. No, I never heard anyone say a BJ. It was always Kempo, always karate, always Taekwondo. It was always boxing. That's it. That's all you got. And then the wrestlers, you know, really always wrestling. That's it. But no one ever thought the guy that was, what was Hoist, 175 pounds? Uh, yeah, 175, 180. Yeah, somewhere in there, right? So, I, I mean, think, I think guy, they waited a minute, 170, 80, he said. Yeah, some, so. a guy like of that stature to come in and to fight the guys that he fought and, and dominate them. 
quick, you know, good hard finishes or good, you know, just a fantastic performance. I would go hoist, obviously being number one, because that's how the sport started. That's what got people involved. I would say Stefan Bonner and, uh, and Forrest Griffin, that fight. But then my last thing to me, John, is I feel like when they really started to, um, t- I guess, make the sport the number one sport was when they bought Strike Force. The reason why I say that is because they bought champions with that. And, oh, yeah. and I'm not, be, I'm not no. being a homer. I'm not no, being no, a no, homer. No. I'm simply saying that was the, that was considered the golden era, I think, of the sport. Man, you had Strike Force, you had Dream, you had uh, UFC, you had these these three promotions. We're all kind of doing pretty doing pretty big fights, and they were fun fights. You know, I mean, you had you know Gegard Mousasi came from there, then went to Strike Force, and then Strike Force, you know, to, to the, the UFC, UFC, and then UFC to Bellator. You know, I mean? like, but I would say that that Strike Force buyout with all the guys that came with it, the whole women's division came with that. That's good. There, okay, that's, that's the big point like, of that one. If you bought it for anything. They can look that's that that's blown that up all of them you know and people sit there say it wasn't only you know obviously cyborg was part of that but you know they kind of held her back based upon weight size they didn't have Mm -hmm. a class for so kind of went on her own they dropped her off but you had Rhonda and misha and amanda liz carmouche Mm -hmm. everyone that became you know the big the big stars in the women's division all came from the strike force yeah you know roster so uh, you can take a look and say here's what no matter what and this is exactly what josh was saying you go back and you watch ufc one and you see hoist the first thing you see is you see gerard Gurdo, and he looks like this ah, he's a tall skinny guy but he beats up taylor tooley who's 450 pounds and kicks him in the face knocks out knocks his tooth out you know punches him you know two shots basically land that's it and he's you know He's the winner. Then he goes and he he just beats the piss out of Kevin Rogier, you know, by stomping on his rib cage. And you know, he just looks like this guy that holy shit, that guy can fight. So you had him, and then you had Ken Shamrock, who ends up beating Pat Smith, beats him with a heel hook, you know, and then Hoyce ends up fighting Ken. He he had beaten Art Jimerson in the first round, but Art didn't look that good, but he was the boxer, and so like Josh is saying he beat the boxer, but we yeah, the boxer just quit. I don't get, I don't understand why. The boxer had one glove on. <laughs> oh, we did. That's the brightest thing to do. But so, so, anyways, then he's facing he's facing Ken Shamrock, and when you when you look at Ken Shamrock, he is put together like a Greek god. Okay, he's two hundred and twenty pounds of just packed on muscle. He's fast. He's athletic. He's, he's got a good. Tadun- he's wearing some tadantarans. He's wearing tadantarans. <laughs> <laughs> he looks fantastic, you know, and so everyone's expecting Hoist to get his ass handed to him. And when he beats Ken, people are like, well, how the hell did that happen? Mm-hmm. What did he do? And then he beats Gerard. And so that grabbed more people's attention. And and I can say that based upon, you know, that the pay-per-view they were expecting was somewhere hoping around 25,000. They got 87,000, hey. I think, was the pay-per-view for that first show pay-per-view for the second show went up into the 200,000s that first show did more than pfl last week (laughs) why because there was this guy named hoist gracie that everyone talked about this skinny guy wearing pajamas and he's he's just choking all these all these big muscular guys and he's just killing them and that grabbed everyone's attention for the sport and so that that was a a pinnacle moment in making people all of a sudden grab hold of MMA, the UFC, and go, hey, this is something really cool. This is something special. This guy's doing stuff that no one's seen before. Okay? Yes, the Stefan uh, Bonner versus uh, Forrest Griffin fight was great for the sport. But there was people watching that entire show that was put on for Spike TV based upon that first season of The Ultimate Fighter. And so people wanted to see the the fighters that they had watched during that season and kind of grown to like grown to hate, which is just all part of what you're doing. That's why Josh Koscheck, who, you know, we had on our show, he was hated, but he played that heel part. Well, and you had other people out there that, you know, weren't the nicest guys pissed on people's bed, but they loved him. You know, Chris Lieben and there was Kenny Florian and there's Diego Sanchez doing his yoga. And they all wanted to see all those guys. It was the performance of Stefan Bonner and, 
force in the fact that they made it what we call, you know, a slobber knocker. They just, you know, set their feet <laughs> at wing shots. It was great. It wasn't the greatest, you know, I'm going to be honest. It wasn't the greatest performance of technical fighting, but man, it was balls. It was big balls and heart throughout. And that's what makes an exciting fight. And so it had a, it had a big impact because a lot of people, the ratings went way up, which is saying that people were calling their friends during that time to, hey, you got to see this. You see in the fight, it's on. You got to turn it on. And people were turning it on, you know, and it ended up reaching a lot of people at that time. So both are, are pinnacle moments in the growth of the sport. You wouldn't have the one yeah. in the Stefan Bonner and Forrest Griffin if you didn't have the beginning, though, with Hoist. That's yeah. just the way I look at it. Yeah, I just look at what moved the needle for them financially. Them spending the fifty million or forty million dollars to buy Strike Force to me was what really kind of well, that kind was of nothing. <clears throat> that, well, and when I say nothing, well, you were saying fifty. They were they were forty four million dollars in the hole. Forty four million dollars in the hole. Strike Force was no the UFC. Oh, okay. And Lorenzo had actually sent Dana out to possibly sell it. Dana went around. You know, Dan Lambert was the guy with the best offer. You know, and it was way down in the, it, it didn't even hit the $10 million mark as far as what he would pay wow. for it. Okay. So he was, you know, the, the Fertitas were going to lose a lot of money. That was when Lorenzo decided, all right, we're going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to do this uh, reality show because he was doing American Casino with Craig Poligian at the time. American Casino was about the Green Valley Ranch uh, Casino that the mm -hmm. Fertitta brothers own. Yeah. And so, you know, they they decided, okay, we're going to do this ultimate fighter. They had no idea what they were really going to do. You know, we talked about that with Bobby Southworth and you know, they didn't know they were going to have people fight and stuff, but he took that opportunity. He paid for all the production. He paid for the time on spike TV to put it on there. That was a $10 million investment when you're $44 million in the hole. So $54 million in the hole at the end of that. But that is what changed everything that's when all of a sudden they started making money that's when all of a sudden they started getting sponsors that's when all of a sudden everything started just turning over for them and all of a sudden they were making money and quickly they were in a position where you know they're not in the red anymore they're in the black and that's a good place to be and then you had the acquisition of pride that was a big part of it mm -hmm. you know that acquisition of pride you know people Pride was the biggest thing there was. It had, it yeah. had surpassed the UFC at a certain point as, okay, the best heavyweights for sure are in pride. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And so, you know, it had surpassed, you know, the, the, the production of it and everything was just, it was better. Mm -hmm. So they had bought pride. Then they had the WFA. And then when strike force ended up being kind of on the market based upon Scott Coker's association with Silicon Valley sports, that's when the UFC ended up getting a steal. If you ask me and yeah. trust me, you know, they had to pay a little bit more <laughs> for certain things. I'm not going to say what it was, but 30, it was basically $40 million, $39 yeah. million dollars later. They owned strike force and the people that they got from strike force made them over a billion dollars. Oh, absolutely. Uh, my point was, I was trying to get to, I wasn't knocking the, the ultimate fighter scenario situation either. I, I didn't okay. think, I think they, one goes to the next. No, the, yeah. the hoist was there. Then the, the Stefan Bonner and uh, Forrest Griffin fight, the pride acquisition was definitely good, but I would put the strike force acquisition above that one. It, it, it was because they didn't get that much from pride. Yeah. They didn't they, get, they that didn't much get the pride. contracts that they thought they were going to get. They, they thought yeah. they were getting Fedor. That was a big part of them buying it. Yeah. And they didn't vet it correctly and fedor could just walk and he did yeah and he did no i understand that but I, my I, I was feeling like the acquisition of strike force really also too is what legitimized the ufc as a real sport because what happened was now you have a women's division and at that time in the u.s they were trying to make every female sport stand out they were always trying to push you know whatever it was whether it was in the olympics or yeah, and not, title nine was put in place for that yes and so they were trying to make that push now the UFC, now it's not just cockfighting, because yeah. go ahead and say that now that we've got women fighting and they're out here, they're they're and they're looking fantastic, by the way. Yeah. They're doing a damn and perform, job. And they're not only looking good as far as their skill set, they're yeah. looking good as far as the way they present themselves coming, you know, to the sport and everything. Yeah. The whole the whole slabang. 
Yeah. So, I mean, I think I felt like that is what helped legitimize the sport itself. Then you get to there and then I don't really know what could be next. We haven't had that next. Whoa. Kind of moment. Um, I think the purchase and the ESPN deal were probably the, the most significant um, because the way ESPN is treating them like a true partner in this business. So um, I would say that probably because look, going from Fox, everyone's like, oh, Fox was huge. Fox was huge. It was great. It got them on a major platform outside of spike TV. But I, like I said, I feel like when you go back and watch any of the ESPN stuff, they never talked about the UFC. They never did. They very rarely would very, show like the, the head kick knockout or it was all, it had to be a highlight of the night or highlight of the week or highlight of the day, or it had to be something like that for them to be put on ESPN. And I remember watching, cause I'm a huge fan of the PTI, pardon the interruption uh, with Tony Kohlheiser and Michael Wilbon, but man, all they ever did was talk shit. The only time they ever, the only time they ever talked positive about MMA is when Herschel Walker was on strike force fighting. This guy, look at him. He's 48 years old, still built like a 49. Greek god. Yeah, all these things, right? That's, I mean, that's what they were talking about. Look at him. They, they, they showed his his uh, knockout finish like probably 40 times. In like but a again, weekend. you got you got to admit, though, and this is where people, you know, we talk all the time about someone stepping over, you know, dollars to pick up dimes, you know, and you got to be smart in your business. And the one thing I'll give the UFC is that whole thing was spike. Look, spike was offering them more money than Fox. They were going to get a lot bigger payday from spike than they were from Fox, but they looked at it and said, this is going to be better for us. So in the, in the long run, it's going to get us more into that mainstream. So they went with Fox and then you had the, yeah, and you have to say it's a big part of the the growth of the sport. The acquisition from Semaphore Entertainment Group to Zufa, yeah, okay, and then Zufa to now TKO, because you, you have what occurred, you know, when the Fertitas sold it for four point two billion, and people went, "That's fucking nuts." There's no fucking way it's worth that. All this stuff, you know, and everything, and all it's done is made. WM, WME IMG, which is now IMG is now just bought by the you know TKO, which was, that's a weird thing yeah. what they do with their things, but it made nothing but money and was a great when you look at it in the end, what a great purchase. How smart is Ari Emanuel, you know, and everything he did. So that's another, you know, you know, keystone moment for the sport when it was sold by the Fertitas. Because it was Ari Emanuel that was able to get that ESPN deal. It was a couple of things. You know, the guy who was the the guy that was the CEO of, of uh, ESPN, he hated the UFC. Yep. But he all of a sudden got in trouble, got into a little bit of uh, something with drugs. I don't know what it was. But all of a sudden he was out and a new person came in and all of a sudden the UFC is welcome. And they made him an incredible offer and they took it. And so, you know, that's how these things happen. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot. <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah. <clears throat> no, but I, I would agree with you. I feel like the ESPN deal, I know the Fox deal definitely gave us a bigger platform. Let me give you guys an example is, you know, when I fought Benson Henderson, I would have never have thought like they'd have, because I fought him in just in January, but guess what was going on in January? The AFC, NFC national uh, championship yeah. game or football game. And there are running commercials during that with game. With Josh Thompson's name on him. <clears throat> and Benson Henderson. Oh, we'll yeah. forget that guy. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, to think, though, that the Fertitas were literally just paying to get TV time a couple of years before that. That's right. And now their fighters are on, you know, national television. Yeah. It's five years. Games to watch. Think about it. You know, five years seems like a long time. It's not. You know, it's really not. It goes by really fast. And, and the Ultimate Fighter was in 2005, and you were fighting on Fox in 2010. Mm-hmm. So, five years. Yeah, I mean, it was. A, I, I feel like that was a great acquisition. Hey, you know what? We got to talk real quick about. No, uh, before we wrap this thing well, up, you can tell me. Joe Rogan, man, congratulations to him and the Donald Trump interview. Oh uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna find out if uh, he has Kamala on. I know that there was talk that she had turned it down. He turned said it the down. offer still. He said the offer still stands. I would have thought she would have went on after. Uh, Trump, uh, her being the, I guess you'd say the sitting president now, because I don't know the other, the other guy's not there. <laughs> so, but right now, but I mean, overall, I mean, think about that, John, 
Think about that. The UFC and that. their the UFC and their and paying for TV time, then going to Fox, then going to ESPN, and just making a truckload of money now. Joe Rogan basically just going to the UFCs and working the shows for free tickets to you know <laughs> no one knowing what he makes now, but you know, handpicking all the stuff he wants to do, being the biggest podcast in the world, having presidential candidates and former presidents and presidents or whatever it is on his show, it's pretty damn impressive. But it was, it's all intertwined, though. Mm-hmm. If It's weird when you think about it, but Donald Trump had a big effect on the UFC when Zufa bought it because that's where they first put on shows was the mm-hmm. Mark Edis Arena in Trump Taj Mahal. Trump was there. It's when I met him. You know, and uh, he is. Then he went with Affliction. If you remember, Trump was like part owner in the Affliction, mm-hmm. you know, thing. And you know that was that was the moment that I said, "All right." You know, and everyone can say what they want about Donald Trump, but I was uh, going to the weigh-ins for the Affliction show. It was the second one. It was down at the Anaheim Pond, and uh, I'm all of a sudden I'm walking across the arena on the floor, and I hear this, you know, John. John and I, and I turn my head and it's Donald Trump. He's calling me out and I'm like, "Are you fucking kidding me? You remember my fucking name, yeah. right?" And he's and he's he weighs me over and I come over and he wanted to introduce me to his son, hmm. and I was like, "Holy shit! I can't believe you fucking remember." That was like in 2008 or something like that. Hmm. But I'm like, "You remember my name from fucking back, you know, in 2000? It's pretty impressive." I'm sure he's watched some UFC because I'm a nobody. No, no, you look. You know when you're somebody, and you know when you're a nobody. And I was a nobody. <laughs> you know, yeah, so. he, probably, he was probably a fan of the sport. And, you know, like you were yeah. pretty much the only ref doing every fucking fight back then. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it changed by that time. Yeah. I, but, look, I, I don't want to get, I'm not going to get too political on this whole deal. But I wanted to simply say that's, that's a big deal, man. To be able to have the, to be able to create, create the status that he has done, Joe Rogan. Oh, my God. Now, and now be able to have. You know, former presidents, someone like Donald Trump, and also like yeah, Bernie Sanders on. He's had Tulsi oh, Gabbard had, on. Tulsi Gabbard, fucking RFK Jr. Yeah. He has anybody. Long, that's, that's what I love about him. Yeah. And so I think I, I want to see be- if the number one, his number one and two shows, I believe, were Elon Musk. The two times that he's had Elon mm-hmm. on has been the ones that have had the most views of any of his shows. I'm yeah. surprised it's not yours and mine. I really am. <laughs> <laughs> But I didn't I do want, so bad. My I, want, I wonder. I oh, no, I'm not. I'm sure you did. But I'm wondering if this one with Trump, based upon how everything is, you know, in the world, because he's going to get people that hate Trump watching it. He's going to get people that love Trump watching it. He's going to get a shit ton of views. Yeah, I think. I think as of this morning, they were already at 121 million downloads. <laughs> and it was Christ. less than 12 hours before it dropped. You got to. You got to be tell me now. Have you Have you listened to it? I listened to the first hour and a half. Okay, I have not. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, look, if I'm going to give one complaint, um, there there was a lot of um, as they were calling it weaving, and what weaving is is when you kind of intertwine one conversation, one point with another point, and yeah. he was kind of just it was weaving into becoming a blanket. So I think I I, I want to I guess I can speak from experience. It's hard because I think a lot of people get excited to be on the show. Yeah, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I don't know if, if that's what it was, but Trump sounded like he had a lot to say, and it was, it did, he was trying to talk about Habib, he was talking about fighters, he was talking about like he was interweaving everything instead of like Joe had to ask him the same question, you know, in the first probably one of the first questions Joe asked him was what is it like to be like the very first day you walk into the Oval Office and like what do they put in front of you like what what is it that like what is that first day? Good question. It was a great question because everyone. I think we all want to know when you walk in. Like, do they just the military sit you down? And like, okay, look, yeah, there are aliens, and we did kill JFK, and you're, <laughs> oh! you know, like all these things. Like, do they tell you? Like, is that book open to you all of a sudden, right? Or is it you have to go asking for it? So I think that's what he. he to me, Rogan feels like he was searching for that. Like, do they tell you there's aliens? Like, hey. I think he wanted something like that. Rogan was looking for the Eddie Bravo answer. <laughs> yeah, and Trump, <laughs> Trump kind of kept weaving into the Lincoln room and the and this and that. And, you know, the rooms have to be like this because Lincoln was six something. And six yeah, and anyways, he was he was kind of he could have struggled early to stay on topic, but he kind of came back around about at least where I'm at now at halfway. It seems like he came back around. He may wander off again. But look, I think um, the fact that he sat there for three hours, two hours and 48 minutes or something like that, and answered all the questions, uh, 
you know, and or try to answer majority of them or as much as he could. I'm not finished done yet. So I thought it was a good, I thought it was so far it was good, but a lot of people are out there undecided. No matter what you do, no matter what you decide to vote. Yeah, just, just vote. go vote. Just go vote. That's, I I, that's my, that's my take on this whole thing. You want your voice heard, just go vote. That's it. Like, doesn't matter what I say. You shouldn't give a shit what I think about politics. You guys don't really give a shit what you think, what I think about fighting. So like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> just, just go vote, register and go vote. Oh. That's my biggest thing. Anyways, I thought it was great. I thought it was, so far I'm an hour and a half in. I thought it was, I think it's pretty good so far. So you're halfway. I'm halfway. Three hour damn fucking. Yeah, <laughs> it is. But the fact that he did it for three hours, I'm very impressed. I would like to see her go on as well. I want to. I want to see her sit. I want to see her sit down for three hours or two, even two hours. I'll take two hours, and just to see what she has to say. That's it. I think it's. I think it'd be good for her to go after Donald Trump so she can rebuttal anything that he wants or anything he's already said on the show. And and Joe could push her in things where he she maybe was he wasn't able to get clarity from Trump. Whatever it is. But Joe is a great interviewer. He lets people feel at home. I thought I thought this was a huge deal. The, the one thing that I saw that was a difference, and I just saw it from a still picture, is Joe Rogan on his podcast. You know, does whatever I want. I've seen him. I've seen him dress up. You know, in Halloween yeah. things and stuff. But it's always, you know, it's it's usually a, like an MMA shirt or something. Yeah. You know, t shirt, <laughs> hoodie, yeah. boom, hoodie. He was in a collared shirt. I know a black, just like he's going to be in the USC. And I went, Oh, Joe, you dressed up. No, yeah. You went out of character. I love that. That's great. I thought it was great, man. That I thought is. it was great. Uh, is there anything else on there, George, on the news? What did we what did I post up on the news? I thought I posted something on the news. Dun, dun, dun. What were we talking about? Oh, uh, there's the we'll talk about that later. Mm, oh, did you this I wanted to talk about this. Oh no. Let's do this on the live show. Oh no. Yeah, it's the re, it's the responses from Don Davis. Uh, Dana White had some numbers for him, and then also to oh, uh, yeah, but it, well, he was he was comparing, and... dude. All right, hold on. They had yeah. a power slap over in there in mm-hmm. in uh, Abu Dhabi, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Now all I hear is all about this, all these numbers, and all oh, oh, there's so much. You know, I don't see shit on that thing. Okay, <laughs> I'm just being honest. Do you? That's why I'm asking. I never see it. Not no. I mean nothing. I don't even see so, it on Instagram. So I don't. Not on Twitter. Not on. I mean I, nothing. And so where is he coming up with all these numbers? I'm not saying that you know it's not real, but I'm just saying someone's lying somewhere. <laughs> I just don't see it. I, I don't, I don't know it. if I, dumpling, it, and I know it was dumpling beat. I don't know the I, the Hawaiian. I'm sorry, oh. but. Did we have two Hawaiians go down in Abu Dhabi, or did one of them become victorious? I don't know. George, people, can you answer that? People tell us. No Ooh. one cares. No one cares. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. I don't. No. George, no you actually hit on the head. I don't care. You don't have to answer it. That's hilarious, man. I, lo- I just love the nickname of the dumpling. That's so funny. Hey guys, that's going to wrap up our show, our UFC 308 talk. And I want to thank you guys so much for continuing to listen to us. Like I said, live on Tuesday nights, uh, we do a live um, super chat on Tuesday nights. Make sure you guys join us. Have some fun, man. It's on our YouTube channel. And also, too, this episode is brought to you by BetUS, as well as Element. Stay salty, my friends. Element. Check out their hydration drinks. They have a sparkling one as well. It's awesome. It comes in the cans. You can also buy the mixtures. With our link down below, you get a free package. It's funny. I've got a lot of friends right now. Have you tried the chili lime? I have. I haven't tried it yet. They it is a little, it's a little weird it's going down because it's a little spicy. That's so sad. It's a little spicy. <laughs> yeah, so. Dude, you know I love hot food. Yeah. But it's it's weird when it's a cold drink and it's like, okay, that a little spice to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I heard the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> Someone said they want to rim it with uh, like a margarita. Oh, dude. Margarita. Yeah, I'm telling you, if you put that in a margarita mix, interesting. It would be delicious. Okay. There you go. There you go. It's a good idea. And I want to remind everyone we have continued our partnership with uh, OnlyFans. So make sure you guys. Subscribe to us over there. It is free. We're going to be doing some extra live chats over there. Just Q and A, Q and A's. Having some conversations with you guys over there. Be posting up some other pictures as well. We kind of with my daily lifestyle, what I'm doing. I had a lot of sports today. Had some sports. Not my daughter. Score. I almost said her name. Uh, my daughter. She did she, she score. Uh, 
She scored her second goal today. Uh, girl Naya. Way to go. Did, she scored, of course. Say, Papa, you owe me another dollar. <laughs> she pointed at me. I it's think you should give her goal. five. No, uh, it's a five dollar. Five dollars. It's inflation. Five dollars a goal. This is true. <laughs> and I want to thank you guys for so always uh, continuing to support us and everything we do. And John, take us away, bud. Hey, for everyone out there, thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed UFC 308 like we did. Be kind to people. Do something good for someone just because you can. It's going to make you feel good, and it's always good for your karma. We will see you.